the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. Good morning, church. It is my privilege today to introduce you to our special guests, the Voices of Lee from Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee. This is the most prestigious a cappella group in the nation. They performed at some of the top venues across the country, like the Beacon Theater on Broadway, Carnegie Hall, and even the White House. For the past 30 years, under the direction of Danny Murray, this group has had a long reputation of excellent music, all to the glory of God. And I know our church will be blessed by their ministry today. So please help me welcome to the stage, the Voices of Lee. I just feel like something good is about to happen. Tell everybody that Jesus Christ is here. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is here. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is still the King of still the King of Kings. Let's just get all excited. Let's 
The Bible says that Jesus is our friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm so thankful that we serve a God that no matter what we go through, no matter how rough the road may be, he will never leave us nor abandon us. He is our present help in the time of trouble. Galatians 5 says that you have been called to live in freedom. So no matter what you're facing today, you don't have to be bound by sin, shame, or despair any longer. Because we know that our God is able to exceedingly, abundantly, and beyond all we can ask, think, or imagine. So look to Him today. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I hope you brought a copy of God's Word with you today because I want you to see one of the most important passages of Scripture for believers that you will ever, ever read. Uh, I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and I want you to see with me this morning verse 12 and verse 13. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and 13. Watch this with me. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When I was a kid growing up in northwest South Carolina, I faced one of the most major paradoxes that I think that anybody could ever face. Um, I was really seeking after God. I wanted to know God with all of my heart. I was willing to do whatever it took to get to know God. And I got involved with uh, some believers in that area. And there was not a service that went by in that church that I didn't go to the altar. And I would wet the carpet with my tears, seeking after God. And there would be a group of people praying with me there. And uh, some on one side would be saying to me, hold on, Mike, hold on. Another group on the other side of me were saying, let go, Mike, let go. <laughs> well, now, I didn't know what to let go of or hold on to. But what was so pervasive in my mind as a teenage boy was um, listening to those testimonies of people whose lives had been changed. And they would stand up in every service and many of them would talk about uh, how sinful and how far away from God that they were. And uh, then they would say how that God changed them. And this was what their life looked like now. And I'd come away with that so envious because I would want to know the answer to the question, how did that happen? How did you get from there to there? And so I set out on a quest. I, I'm, I'm going to prove to God that I am worth something. Uh, so I started letting go of uh, what I was told was sin in my life. And I, I quit doing this and I quit doing that. And then I started adding things to my life. Uh, but in the midst of all of that, I never knew God. I came to grips with the fact many years later, no wonder I didn't know God because I was trying to do it through my own efforts. It, the Bible says, it is not of works 
If it were, then you would go about bragging about it. Not of works, but that's the paradox. Uh, then there's that group of people today, more so now than ever before, that says, well, there's really nothing you can do. It's all of God. God makes those determinations. So we still got a paradox going on. And then I come across, as I'm going verse by verse through this book, another paradox where the Bible says, work out. You ought to, you ought to highlight those two words. Work out your own salvation. I read a little bit further on in that phrase and it comes out, but it's God who works in. So here we go all over again faced with a dilemma. How do you reconcile those two things? How do you deal with that? I want to remind you today that Paul is writing to people that are now already believers. They've already been saved. They've already given their heart and life to Jesus. They've already gone through a conversion experience. And I'll show you something here that it says, work out your salvation. He didn't say work for your salvation. But he says, work it out. Um, you already have everything that you need now as a believer You've you got everything that you need now to grow and to work this thing out. It, it, it's kind of like this. It's like going to a gym. How, how many of you go to a gym or have a gym in your home and, and you work out? Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Some of you, it ain't working for some of you. I can just tell that. But. <laughs> so why do you go to the gym? You don't go to the gym to get a body. You go to the gym to develop the body. You don't work for salvation. You already have that. So he says, work that out. I got this little game that I play every day of my life nearly. It's from the New York Times, and it's a game called Connections. Anybody play Connections? I play Connections. And uh, it, it's a word game, if you will, and it, it, it's word by association, and you, you, you've got to figure out uh, how, what, what word goes with what word. There are four of them. I think there's like 16 words, and you figure out what four matches the other, what one matches the other three. Now, I have everything right there in front of me to work that puzzle out. I don't have to put anything or add anything to it. It's already there. All I got to do is just work it out. And, and that's what Paul is talking about here in this passage. Now, notice the other word that he uses is work out your salvation. You, you understand, you and I, as believers, have an individual assignment. It's not to work out somebody else's salvation. But it's to work out your salvation salvation. It, it has eternal significance behind it. It is extremely uh, important. I'm grateful to God. Uh, one of the lessons that I learned as uh, I was coming uh, up in the Lord was that God wasn't looking for a bunch of cookie cutter Christians. You don't have to be like somebody else. Uh, God has a plan for you. And the Bible says to work that out. Quit trying to be somebody else. Qu quit looking at somebody else's walk with God and want what they want. God has something extremely special just for you. He's not looking for any more Billy Grahams. He has a design and a plan just for your life. Then he says, work it out with fear and with trembling. Now, he's not talking about the fact that you ought to shake in your boots uh, when you are encountering God. Don't be afraid of God. You're part of the family of God, and you don't need to be afraid of being in the family of God. But what he is saying is, be afraid that you're going to miss out on something that God has designed 
just for you in your life. It is a life and a death issue and there's absolutely nothing more important than you realizing everything that God wants for you and your life and notice what else it says now for it is God who works in you powerful words it's God who works in you if you look at the Greek context in that, you'll discover that it is the word where we get our word energy from. The Bible tells us here that it's God is our energizer. It's God who will give you the power to do what he wants us to do. He gives you the desire to serve him and to grow in him. And then he gives you the ability to do it. He is the one who helps us as we grow in our relationship with him. Now, when we think about who we are and where we are in life, I'll ask the question this morning. How many of you are really happy with who you are and where you are right now in your walk with God? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand, but how many of you really, when you analyze your life this morning, how many of you would confess, I really need to change? I need to be better than I am. I need to be different than I am. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not like I used to be, but the fact of the matter is I'm nowhere near where I need to be in my walk with God. And, and I really, if you were to confess, you'd probably say I haven't grown spiritually near as much as I'd like to. And I want to change, and I need to change. Well, I want to talk about that change for just a minute because I believe that God gives us three tools, three instruments by which you and I can change. First of all, I believe he gives us instructions to change. We, we can choose to use the instructions that he has left for us. In other words, I'm talking this morning about the Bible. Uh, he's given us the Word of God that can change us. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, and by the way, that's generic right there, that the people of God may be mature, may be complete and thoroughly equipped to do everything that God has designed for us to do in this life. That is the purpose of his word. The word of God changes us. It changes the way that we think. And I wonder how many of you are here this morning or watching live stream across the world today. How many of you really are serious when it comes to the word of God? Are you serious about this book? And if you really want to be who God wants you to be, you got to get into the book. you got to study the book. you got to memorize the scripture. And, and then you don't just memorize it just to, to accumulate a bunch of information. You're to live out the word of God. Let it come alive through you. And the more that you're into the Word of God, the more the Word of God has the opportunity to change your life. That's a tool that God gives us. I, I have people come up to me all of the time and, and you, they get challenged somewhere along the way and all of a sudden they get to internalizing and they'll say, well, you know, Pastor, uh, I just don't have enough faith. And, and my first question back to them is, well, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? Are you really serious about knowing what the Word of God teaches? But because that has everything in the world to do with your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if you want your faith increased, Get into the Word of God. And the Word of God is an instrument and a tool, a word of instruction that God uses to transform your life. 
Number two, he has given us inspiration. He's given us inspiration, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit that enables you to do what you can't do on your own. Listen to God's word in Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, <laughs> I wonder how many of us really, really, really understand that. I wonder how many of us have even thought about it. The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's a staggering thought. He who raised Christ from the dead also will give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit that dwells in you. Two times right there, he's simply saying, hey, that tomb is empty by the power of God that lives in you today. That's an instrument of inspiration that God uses when he took up residence in your heart and your life. He brought with him resurrection power to be who he wants you to be. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror in the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. You can't do it on your own. The Spirit of God's got to do it. You know, when God breathed unto man the breath of life, it was on the heels of what he said, let us make man in our image. And that's been the purpose of God from the very beginning, that we be like him that we be transformed and changed to be like him. So he uses instruction, he uses inspiration, and then he uses instances that occur in our life. Problems and pressures and difficulties and stress. Would you agree with me this morning that those things have a way of getting our attention? They have a way of getting us focused. Listen to the scriptures in Romans 8. And, you know, the last four or five years, that's about all I've quoted. But it's so real. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and to those that are called according to his purpose. But now we leave out that next verse. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now he's not talking about predestining people uh, to heaven or to hell, but listen to what he is predestined. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn uh, among many brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a child of God, if you've been born again, been saved by the grace of God, understand that everything that happens to you is filtered, first of all, through the hands of God before it ever gets to you. Uh, grab hold of that. When you're faced with all kinds of exigencies in life and problems and difficulties, and you ask the question, wait a minute, now where did all this come from? How did I get here? Is this a result of a bad decision that I made? Is this part of the flesh? Did the enemy do this to me or did God do this to me? And the real answer to that, it really doesn't matter where the problems came from at all. God then is going to use them in his divine purpose and plan and pattern for your life. God allowed Jesus to go through all kinds of garbage. He allowed him to go through all kinds of things. He was tempted, the Bible says, in every fashion, every point like you are. He was tempted with loneliness. He was de tempted with depression. He was tempted to get angry. He was tempted uh, to be impatient. C can I ask you a question this morning? If God the Father allowed God the Son to be tempted and facing with all kinds of problems like that, who in the world do we think that we are that we're not going to face them? Hmm? Who in the world do we think that we're not going to have to deal with them? And the reason is this. God's a whole lot more interested in your character than he is your comfort. 
Hebrews 5 says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Hebrews 2 tells us that he was made mature and perfect through suffering. And how in the world do you think that you and I are ever going to be complete? How are we going to be mature? How are we going to be developed in our walk with God if we don't face the same things that Jesus faced? So he works through instruction, he works through inspiration, and he works through instances. Watch this with me. God says that you and I are commanded in Scripture to be humble, right? Humble yourselves under God. Humble ourselves. And then he gives us the power in the person of the Holy Spirit to achieve humility. But somewhere along the way, we don't do what we read and we don't do what we're empowered to do. And God says, okay, you're forcing my hand here. And since my word's not enough and since the spirit of God's not enough to get you there, then he allows us to go through situations in this life that will humble us. And let me just tell you, God, he, he's got my number and he knows how to humble me. Great. He's got a thousand ways in which he humbles me in my life. And, and, and here's the deal. If you were to read, I don't know how long you spend in, in the Word of God. I really don't. But, but if you read the Bible six hours a day, there's still 18 hours left in that day. You're faced with a whole lot more situations and a whole lot more circumstances. There, there's a tremendous amount more time that God has through situations and circumstances to work in our life. And he often and more often chooses to do that rather than the first two. To bring about his plan for us. Listen to Proverbs chapter 20. Blows and wounds scrub away evil. And beatings purge the inmost being. The fact of the matter is, and I believe you will agree with me on this. You listening? Say amen. amen. We rarely change until we get desperate. We rarely change until the pressure mounts. We rarely change until we get under major stress. It's not when we see the light, but when we feel the heat. And God oftentimes has to light a fire under us to get us to the point that we really do change. Now, that's God's part. Let, let me talk a little bit about our part. And I know my time is gone, but ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's really important that you understand this second half of this message. Number one, you ready? I can choose what rolls over in my mind. I can choose what I let roll over. In my mind, if I want to change, if I want to be who God wants me to be, God's given me his word, he's given me his Holy Spirit, and he uses the stuff that I go through to get me to that point. But there's some things that I have to do if I am going to be who he wants me to be. And one is I've got to learn how to control my thoughts. I've got to learn how to control my mind. The Bible says, guard your heart. Your life is shaped by what you think about. You know, your thoughts really do direct your life. What you think about ultimately is how you behave. And it really reveals who you are, doesn't it? I wonder if we could, you know, media has come a long way. Uh, we're doing so many things with media now, it's mind-boggling, but... I wonder what people think that you really are as opposed to who you really are. I wonder if there was some technology that could be developed that could take your thoughts and video it on the widescreen up here. And if that were to happen, we would really see who you are, wouldn't we? Not who we thought you are. But your thoughts reveal who you are. And, and so the Bible says, guard your thoughts. 
Uh, don't let that junk roll over in your heart. Ephesians 4 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. Now, when we talk about change and transformation, the biblical term here is the term repentance. And it means stop going in that direction and start going in this direction. Direction. I can tell you on April the 12th, 1970, on Ransier Avenue in Colleen, Texas, at Eastside Baptist Church, I was gloriously saved by the grace of God. And the first thing that happened is my mind changed. My thoughts changed. I changed the way that I thought about myself. I changed the way that I thought about other people. I changed the way that I thought about God. I was renewed in my mind to the point that those old values that I held in my life were challenged and new values began to take place. Romans 12, 2, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way that you think determines the way that you feel. The way that you feel determines the way that you act. And the problem is this. You and I have all of this stuff backwards. And we think that if we're going to change, we just got to change the way, way we do things. That's not it at all. The way you do things is not going to change the way that you feel. And the way that you feel is not going to change the way that you think. But the Bible tells us the way you think will determine what you feel and the way you feel will determine what you do. Quit trying to change by your actions. Go to the source of the problem, which is the way that you think. Mm. My car, so aggravating. This new technology stuff in automobiles. Does, does your car have this thing on it? I, I, if I get close to that yellow line over there, if I get close, it'll jerk me back over into the lane. And if I want to change lanes, seriously, I got to muscle up and turn that thing on. And that's exactly what a lot of people think. If I'm going to grow in the Lord, I've got to muscle up and I've got to use willpower to get it done. The problem with trying to change with willpower, it does work for a little while, but after a while, you revert right back. You start smoking again. You start drinking again. You start doing this other garbage all over again. And there's really no real change that has occurred because you haven't gone to the root of the problem, which is in the way that you think. Be transformed by renewing your mind. You got to choose what you think about God. You got to choose what you think about the Word. Fill your mind with Scripture, if you will. That's what he's talking about. Philippians 4 8 says, Think on these things. And then in Joshua 1 and 8, if you really want to be successful, figure it out. He says, think on the word of God day after day, night after night. Let the word of God permeate and penetrate your thinking. And then you're able to do what his will is as he's written it out for you. I, I wonder, do you have a daily quiet time? Do you spend time in the Word of God? I'm just going to tell you, friend, not much change is going to occur in your life until you have a time that you get alone with God. Watch what rolls over in your mind. Number two, rely on the Spirit of God every moment. John 15 says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches, and you're not going to live if you're not tied up to the vine. The Bible says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. My wife and I are so frustrated right now, it's unbelievable. We, we got to... We, we got a spot in our yard. Any landscapers in, in the house? I, I've got the third bush that I planted right in this spot. And that third bush has died. 
we, we, we went in there, yeah, I believe it was uh, Thursday, was it Thursday? And Kathy says, I want that bush gone. I want it gone. I want it gone. Yes, ma'am. Now, I had a choice, okay? We had a choice. I, I, I could go over there to that bush, and I could pull it up and dig it up and move it out. Or I thought about going to Hobby Lobby and, and get me some greenery and some duct tape. And I thought about ductating some green leaves around that dead stump. And it would look really good. But a lot of Christians are doing the same thing. You know what they're doing? There's really no life there. there there's no growth. And they just kind of stagnated. And they want to dress up by good works. They want to array themselves by good deeds so that they can look good to everybody else. But I'm going to tell you, unless the Spirit of God does it in us, we're never going to be able to develop and to grow and to mature to be what Jesus is. What, what, what's the difference in this life? I, I mean, what, what, what goes on? The Bible just simply says if God doesn't flow in us and through us and we're not depending on him, we're not going to amount much to anything. You say, what's, what's the, how, do you, how do you know the difference? How do, you, how do you know the difference that this is works of the flesh or works of the Spirit? I can tell you real quickly how you can know the difference, whether it's you or whether it's God in you that's working in you, is check your prayer life out. What you pray about is what you're depending on God for. What about the decisions that you're making in your life today? Have you asked God about them? I was sitting at my computer last week, and, and, and I, I couldn't believe it. I was just praying. As I was sitting there, I was just talking to God. You, you have a constant communication with God. I, I, I'm telling you, that's a beautiful thing. And, and, and I'm just sitting there and just talking to God about stuff. And, and, and this, I, I hadn't had any time off much, and... I was thinking, you know, I need to get out. I need to go do something. I said, God, do you want me to go do that? Is that something that I need to go do now? I'm telling you, in two minutes, God answered that prayer. Just like that right there. I said, wow. I guess you don't want me to go do that, then do you? Do you pray about the decisions in your life? Do, 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 do you pray about the relationships. I wonder how many of you right now are in a relationship of your own choosing that you didn't even pray about. How about what you buy? You pray about your purchases or you just go do it? Check your prayer life out. Um, choose what you're going to let roll over in your mind. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Number three, choose how you respond to situations that come up in your heart and your life. Now, now I want to tell you, your pastor doesn't always get it right here. Confession. I don't always get it right here. But it's a choice. I, I can choose when stuff happens how I'm going to, re listen, we, we did this a couple of months ago, but listen, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, underline the word trying there, circle that word, the trying of your faith, it's really the process of your faith. The progress of your faith works patience, but let patience have her own perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, he's saying to us as believers, understand just simply because you got saved doesn't mean God's done with you. This thing of walking with him is a process. And he's saying, I want you to work it out. Work out that salvation. God's seeking to produce character in all of us. And James is simply saying, I choose my response 
to life. You can't choose what's going to happen the rest of the day. You can't choose what's going to happen this coming week. You can't choose what's going to happen next year. But you can choose how you are going to respond to life. That's your choice. It'll make you or it'll break you. How you choose to respond will be a stepping stone to mature you to be who God wants you to be or it'll be a stumbling block that will cause failure in your life. It's your choice. Here's a statement that I made in the early service. What happens to you is really not nearly as important as what happens in you. And that's what God's seeking to do. You want want to know something funny about God? It's really not funny. But it'll raise your eyebrows. He's wanting to put the fruits of the Spirit in you, right? So, um, one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. What does God do? He puts you in direct relationship with a bunch of unlovely people. Hmm? Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. Amen? He didn't put you on a beach in Tahiti to produce peace in your life. But he'll bring about chaos in your life so that he can produce the peace. Joy. He wants to produce joy in you. So what does he do? He brings all kinds of problems and issues and difficulties to show you that there's a big difference in joy and happiness. That's what God does. Self-control is one, right? The only restaurant open in town would be a buffet. <laughs> or your next resident is right beside the haagen store to produce self-control. So I'm going to ask you a question as I close, okay? I know I've been a little long today. I'm sorry. What do you, what do you want to, what do you see in your life right now that needs to be changed the most? What is it about yourself you just would love to change? Well, I want to ask you, what are you relying on? Are you relying on you? Or are you relying on the Word and the Holy Spirit? To make you different. And how many of you would make a decision this morning that you're going to choose the right response when situations and circumstances hit your life to know that God is going to give you the power and the unction and the energy to be able to work out what he's already put in you what's it going to be are you going to leave today in the same spiritual condition that you came in or would you make a commitment today you know what God I've been trying to do this on my own long enough I'm not in your word like I ought to be and I'm not trusting you in me Would you stand with me as we pray together for a minute? Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence among us. And and Lord, I have sensed you in this room from the very beginning. Thank you that you've done a work in my heart before I ever got here. Thank you for forgiving me when I don't get it right. I pray, God, that you would continue to work out 
through me and in me that which you have deposited in me, God. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.